Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar with Andrew Suskind, titled Seven Keys to Purposeful Recovery, hosted by Center for Healthy Sex. Let me just tell you a little bit first about Center for Healthy Sex. Uh, we're a sex therapy center in Los Angeles. We provide treatment for sexual dysfunction, porn addiction, love addiction, sex addiction, and partners of sex addicts. Uh, we offer both individual and couple therapy and 11-day intensives. So for a free consultation, you can call us anytime at 310-843-9902. And um, I'm also the co-author with Alexander Katahakis of our book, daily meditation book, Mirror of Intimacy. Right now, we're offering a Valentine's special, 20% uh, off on Amazon. So please, we hope you'll get the book. Uh, they're selling out. We've only got a few hundred left. Um, I want to let you know that this webinar is being recorded, and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel, which is at, you can find it online at www.youtube.com backslash Center for Healthy Sex. So I'm really happy to introduce today Andrew Suskind. He is a friend of our sensors, and he's a licensed clinical social worker, a certified coach, a somatic experiencing practitioner, and a certified group therapist, and he's based in West Los Angeles. He completed a Bachelor of Arts degree in psychology from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst in 1988 and a Master of Social Welfare degree from UCLA in 1991. In 2005, he co-founded Recovery Coaches International, RCI, and in 2014, he released his workbook, which is titled, From Now On, Seven Keys to Purposeful Recovery. In addition to maintaining a general practice here in Los Angeles, he specializes in addictions, trauma, and codependency, and he's consulted with The Bridge to Recovery, Clearview, and Promises. For more information about Andrew, you can visit his website at http, uh, you know, the thing, www.andrewsuskind.com. And it's right here on our first slide. So, Andrew, thanks so much for joining us, and I'll let you take it away. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. Uh, welcome, everybody. It's uh, a new form of technology for me, so it's interesting talking with you wherever you are in various regions of the country or maybe beyond, who knows. But I'm very pleased to be here, and thank you so much uh, to the Center for Healthy Sex for inviting me to participate in this webinar. So today, as you all know, the title of the webinar is Seven Keys to Purposeful Recovery. And I just wanted to share a little bit of backdrop about purposeful recovery and how that term came about. So in 1994, I went to my first 12-step meeting, and my background is in sex addiction, but I consider that to be part of the story. I think sex addiction, love addiction, love avoidance, codependency, fantasy, and for me, perfectionism are all part of my recovery. And purposeful recovery is really about looking at what is it beyond the, the usual things that we look at? What is it that helps us really take a look at purpose and meaning and whatever counts most to you in, in your life? And although we can talk about these ideas, these spiritual existential type ideas, Oftentimes they get shortchanged in therapy or in the 12 step rooms at times, uh, not to say they're completely shortchanged, but what I found was I was in the 12 step rooms for many years and there was still a lot of suffering, including my own. And when I made the shift around uh, 2000 into a coach training, it, it got me started to, to look at purpose and meaning and passion in a different way than I've ever had before. And that's really what I want to talk about today. And hopefully some of the tools I'll be sharing with you are really ways to reduce the vulner vulnerability to relapse. Um, I don't know if any of you uh, remember this, but back in the early 90s, when people were going to rehab, they would go for 28 days. And then at the end of 28 days, they would be sent home, maybe with a therapist referral, maybe with some 12 step phone numbers, but that was it. It was really very limited. 
um, things have changed, thank goodness. But at that time, there was so much relapse. And unfortunately, today in 2016, there still is a lot of relapse. So my personal mission, my personal purpose around purposeful recovery is how can we equip people to hopefully have tools that will reduce their vulnerability to relapse. It's certainly not everything, but it adds another dimension to what's already out there. So with that said, I'm going to, let's see, um, if I can, here we go. All right, so I'm going to share a little bit about the outline that we're going to go over in our hour together. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between coaching therapy and sponsorship. I'm going to talk about what coaching really is, in my opinion. I'm going to talk about the history of coaching, as well as the idea of recovery coaching. And finally, I'm going to spend most of our time today talking about purposeful recovery. Most of you know the work of Brene Brown by now. Brene Brown took the world by storm in 2010 when her YouTube TED Talk video entitled The Power of Vulnerability came out. If you haven't seen that YouTube TED Talk, after we finish here today, please go and listen to Brene Brown for 20 minutes. It's so inspiring. And the reason I mention her as part of this talk is because her work really parallels everything that I've done as a therapist, a coach, and a person in recovery. And she talks about the concept of wholeheartedness. And I love the idea of wholeheartedness because I once heard somebody talk about addiction as broken heartedness. Okay, not, not broken hearts, but the broken heartedness that all of us who are in, involved in addictive compulsive tendencies go through. And of course, the, the way of healing beyond brokenheartedness is, is mending broken hearts. So the idea here is that we're mending the broken hearts of clients, we're mending the broken hearts of ourselves, we're mending the broken hearts of those in the 12-step rooms, and maybe even beyond. It's not just about addiction, but we're talking about addiction recovery today. So going from brokenheartedness to mending broken hearts is an integral, fundamental way that I look at what, what uh, we all do. I also believe that it truly, truly takes a village to heal from addiction. And not to sound too trite, but I, I used to be a lone ranger out there in many ways. Uh, as a clinician, I felt like a lone ranger. As a clinician in recovery, I felt like a lone ranger. I'm really pleased to say that 20 plus years later, I am part of a village and I have made a point of creating a community around me, both professionally and personally, where I can fully be myself and I can be transparent about who I am. And so professionally, it's so important to find other folks who can work with you collaboratively. A multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach, and I'm not just talking about doctors, nurses, therapists, coaches. I'm talking about any healing approach that works for somebody because this is not a one-size-fits-all process. We never know what's going to have impact for a particular person. So sometimes it takes some trial and error until you or I find the healing approach that really makes a difference. And in my experience, I have had many different healers along the way, and I don't know exactly who or what made the difference, but my life is, is fuller, my life is much more abundant, and I feel much more content and much more comfortable in my skin nowadays than I did 25 years ago. Um, also, I believe that coaching and positive psychology, which we're going to be talking about in a few minutes, really adds a vital dimension of support. It adds another language, another way of looking at recovery that is very optimistic and, and really helps people feel more whole rather than uh, defective. So I wanted to talk for a few minutes briefly about the differences between coaching and therapy, and I'm really talking about 
the difference is based on my own work, okay? So I was trained originally as a psychodynamic therapist. I, I use a lot of different modalities nowadays, but to keep this particular contrast clean, I'm gonna talk about coaching from my perspective and psychodynamic psychotherapy from my perspective. So coaching is often phone-based, but it can be in the office or it can be mobile where a coach actually goes to their client. A therapist is almost always doing their work in their office. Coaching traditionally was 30 to 45 minutes, sometimes now it's 60 minutes, 90 minutes, it's all kinds of variations. Therapy, of course, is typically 45 to 50 minutes. Coaching is almost always short-term. It's not really meant to be long-term. It's really meant to be a finite short-term process. Therapy, on the other hand, can be either short or long-term, depending on the needs of, of the client. Coaching um, is goal-driven, action-oriented, and future-focused. Therapy, on the other hand, is internal world-focused and process-oriented. Okay. Coaching is highly structured. It's really meant to be structured with assignments, with accountability. Therapy typically has no specific agenda from a psychodynamic perspective. Coaching allows email contact, often texting between sessions. Therapy is, has minimal contact between sessions. Coaching, this, this is probably the key. Okay, so somebody says to me, What's the difference really between coaching and therapy? This is my first answer. I say that coaching is really focusing on the present tense toward the future. Therapy, on the other hand, is focusing on the past, the themes and patterns of the past, working towards the present. Okay, so that's kind of the, the simplest way of thinking about the main difference between coaching and therapy. Coaching does not go into the past. Therapy can go into the future, but focuses more on the past into the present. Uh, coaching is a strengths-based wellness model. Therapy is originally about deficits and looking at what's wrong or what's missing. Coaching tools include accountability, requesting, and goal setting. These are all collaborative things, accountability, requesting, and goal setting. Psychotherapy tools include reflecting, interpreting, and confronting. So that's the nuts and bolts of the difference between therapy and coaching, briefly about sponsorship and coaching. And by the way, I've, I've been a sponsor, I've been a sponsee, I've been a coach, I've been a, a coaching client, I've been a therapist, I've been a therapist client. So I've been in all the different uh, roles at different times. And this is, again, just through my lens. So sponsorship, in my opinion, and I think traditionally, is really about the steps. It's about working the steps with someone. And in coaching, it's also about steps, but it's about action steps that are developed by the, the coaching client. Okay, so not so much about the 12th step, but about action steps. Sponsorship is usually longer term. Uh, coaching is shorter term. Sponsorship is based on being of service by giving back what was originally given to you, usually by working the steps with someone else in a way that uh, a sponsor worked with you through the steps. And coaching is a, it's a paid professional relationship with specific uh, professional framework that goes along with it. Sponsors often give direction and advice, where coaching is more about finding the resourcefulness in the client and helping the client discover their own direction. Okay, so that's again a very nutshell version of the differences. And I'm happy, by the way, to, to answer any questions that you might have along the way today or even afterwards if you want to email me. I'm happy to receive. Uh, questions uh, after the web webinar is over. So I wanted to define coaching. If a lot of people have trouble or are not familiar with what coaching really is, according to the International Coach Federation, and for those of you who are not familiar with the International Coach Federation, it's the overseeing body that creates the ethics and, and the framework and the certifications 
for coaches, uh, kind of like the American Psychological Association or the National Association uh, for Social Work. So this is their definition. Coaching is about partnering with clients in a thought-provoking and creative process that inspires the client to maximize their personal and professional potential. So it's about personal goals, it's about professional goals, but it's about partnering with the client and helping inspire them to move forward. Coaching is an ongoing relationship which focuses on clients taking action toward the realization of their vision, goals, or desires. So the coach helps the coaching client develop a vision, helps them develop clear-cut goals, and, and really soul searches with them as to what their desires truly are, and then helps them structure some action steps towards realizing those visions, goals, or, or desires. Coaching uses a process of inquiry and personal discovery to build the client's level of awareness and responsibility and provides the client with structure, support, and feedback. Okay, so it's really about awareness and responsibility or accountability, we could say, and it's about creating structure through support and feedback. The coaching process helps clients both define and achieve professional and personal goals faster and with more ease than would be possible otherwise. I'll just share a quick story. I worked with my coach several times through the years, but originally as part of my coach training program, and her name was Sam, and I was feeling a bit stuck at the time, and what we did was we started to just gain some perspective on what was it that I really, really wanted from my life at the time, and this was back in 2000, 2001, and all I can say is there was a process in that that was very exciting for me because Sam was not only a very talented uh, and intuitive coach, but she was so present with me. She was not only in my corner, but I always say she, she walked beside me when I felt like I needed someone to walk beside me, and she walked behind me when I felt like I needed somebody to kind of push me forward. And it really was a turning point for me in, in my uh, life because at the time I was working part-time in agencies, <coughs> excuse me, part-time in agencies and part-time in private practice. And I was really, really scared to make the, the leap into full-time private practice. And with Sam's help, I, I was able to work through the uncertainties, the, the doubts, and, and the fears. And, and she really helped infuse some of the resources that I had learned in, in my 12-step work into making that all possible. So that was my original experience with coaching, was working with somebody who really was there for me in a, in a way that I really didn't know how to be there for myself. So coaching, for those of you who are not aware of it, is fairly new, okay? So in the 70s and 80s, executive or corporate coaching was something that was being looked at in mostly grad schools of psychology. And in graduate schools of psychology, what they would do is they would teach about organizational development, industrial psychology, and how to work with executives and, and uh, corporate types in order to be most effective in the workplace. And that was really the beginning of executive coaching. At the time, they might have been called consultants or they might have been uh, called organizational developers, but actually executive coaching started back then. By the 90s, life coaching emerged and it was a, a big deal because the executive coaches, I think, realized that a lot of their clients in the corporate structure could benefit from life skills and, and life goals beyond the professional uh, framework. And so life coaching not only emerged, it exploded onto the scene and became very, very popular very fast. And I think the timing of it was such that for whatever reason, our culture, both here in the States and internationally, was ready for coaching to emerge and become 
something uh, of, of value that really made a difference for a lot of folks. So in 1998, there was a real turning point. Um, for those of you who are not familiar with Martin Seligman, he is a psychologist from the University of Pennsylvania who had written back in the 60s and done a lot of research about learned helplessness. Learned helplessness. So he was basically studying depression. And he shifted gears in the 80s and said, well, if we can study learned helplessness, I wonder if we can study learned optimism. So he studied and researched and wrote a book actually called Learned Optimism. And in the 90s, he went on to develop a, a program that was called Authentic Happiness. He wrote a book called Authentic Happiness. And in 1998, he, he was voted in as the president of the American Psychological Association, which is a really big deal. It's a huge, huge organization. And whenever they bring in a new president, they ask that president to come up with a theme for the year. And the theme of the year in 1998 was positive psychology. And that term had never been coined before, never been used widespread before. And what was, what was so exciting about him bringing positive psychology into the public eye was that researchers and psychologists all around the world really came out of the woodwork and said, you know, I've been studying resiliency all these years, and I've been studying flow and resourcefulness and forgiveness and gratitude. And so all these researchers from around the country all of a sudden came out of their, their uh, what, wherever they go when they uh, have that research place. I guess they have to hibernate a bit to do that work. And at that point, what happened was they created a community, a community of positive psychologists. And ever since 98, there's been a national symposium on positive psychology and an international symposium for positive psychology. I had a chance to go to one of the national symposiums. And it's very, very exciting because in my opinion, positive psychologists are really researching and creating the data for what coaches do all the time. I, I look at it in some ways as the research side of coaching, but it's very much side by side and overlapping in different ways. So needless to say, Marty Seligman was truly a pioneer in many ways. And oh, he created the first graduate program, by the way, at the University of Pennsylvania called the Master of Arts in Positive, Positive Psychology, MAP for short. So with that said, nowadays here in the 21st century, there's all kinds of subspecialties of coaching. There's recovery coaching, there's brain-based coaching, there's ADD coaching, there's career coaching, and they're all valuable in different ways. But today I'm gonna to be talking most about recovery coaching and how purposeful recovery fits into that. So recovery coaching is a term that is misunderstood quite a bit and is used in different ways by different people. So again, there's no one size fits all, and I don't pretend to have the only definition of coaching or recovery coaching out there. But in my book, it's best if a recovery coach has at least basic coach training under their belt, uh, some kind of certification uh, in coaching, because that way they've got the framework, they have the practice of working with clients, and they have the supervision and the consultation in, in coaching. And that was my way of learning coaching separate from my therapy. And I, I really think it's, it's important to be able to uh, come from a professional place because professional coaches truly are such a valuable asset. Um, but like anything, um, unfortunately, it, there's, there's folks out there who are wonderful and folks who aren't so wonderful. So it's up to you um, as clinicians and as folks in recovery or anyone who's listening to, to do your research and to make sure that you find people who have the proper training and, and background in this. 
So with that said, coaches have been working with clients in addiction recovery for many years. I think that goes without saying, because ever since coaching has been around, maybe since the corporate days, of course, there's folks who have been dealing with addictive and compulsive behaviors. So coaches have been already seeing these kinds of people in their practice. Um, and so it's, uh, it's a, a matter of um, knowing that, oh, okay, I identify that that person has that issue and that maybe I could address it or maybe there's a different person or coach that might be able to address it. Um, I just had a question that popped up um, from Michael, and I'm going to read it to you. It says, Sean Anchor references Dr. Seligman's work, right? I'm actually not familiar with Sean Aker. Um, I bet it's somebody that I probably need to know about, but uh, a lot of people Oh, uh, sorry, a lot of people out there will reference Dr. Seligman's work because it's so universal and applies to coaches and therapists and, and lots of professionals out there. So um, I don't know Sean Aker, Michael, unfortunately, but, uh, but it wouldn't surprise me if, if Dr. Seligman is being quoted and, and referenced by a lot of folks out there. But thank you for asking the question. Okay. Um, so in 2005, my uh, colleague, Aletta Schuyler, who practices up in Seattle, um, she and I co-founded an organization called Recovery Coaches International. And the reason why we founded RCI is because we felt that it was important to have a place for recovery coaches to receive support and training and uh, to have a community of folks who are like-minded. And so RCI started in 2005 and it's still out there today. Um, its uh, website is www.recoverycoaching.org. So Alida Schuyler, my co-founder, also has an organization up based in Seattle called Crossroads Coaching. And she established the very first recovery coach training program which was certified by the ICF, the International Coach Federation. And again, um, I think it's something that is important to look out for and make sure that you have, uh, if you're looking for a coach training program or you're looking for a coach who's been through a coach training program, just to double check where they've done their, their background. So now we're gonna move on to what purpose truly is. So as I discussed back in 2001, 2002, I had my own slump. I really was feeling burnt out. And at the time, uh, had only a therapy practice and was just feeling like, how could I do this the rest of my life? I was just feeling like it was a little exhausting at the time. And so I, embarked on my own search for purpose. And I didn't really know that I was doing this at the time, but I went, when I went for coach training, what I realized very soon into it was that it's not just about becoming a coach. It was about a soul searching of, of really what mattered most to me. And so these are the kinds of things that have to do with our search for purpose. It has to do with core values or values clarification. It has to do with looking at our passions, our priorities in life. The big question often ask yourself, which I ask myself many times, is what brings me joy? What brings you joy? And if a client has trouble answering this question, it's going to be a bit of an uphill battle, uh, but it's, it's really an investigation you know, to find out what brings somebody joy. And usually the clue is to find out what brought them joy historically as a kid or along the way to find moments that were joyful for them. Of course, it's a search for meaning. It's about heart's desire. What, what is your heart's desire? Uh, positive psychologists talk about what makes life worth living or a reason to wake up in the morning. And I like those expressions. What makes life worth living? Or what is the reason to wake up in the morning? These are big questions. 
of course. Sometimes easier to answer, sometimes not as easy to answer. Recovery, to me, is really like a, a blank canvas. It's about starting over, having a second chance. Um, it's about a crossroads and, and deciding to, to go in a new direction. And it's about new beginnings. So I have a question from Marty Simpson in West Hills, California. Uh, Marty asks, do therapists need specialized coach training or is coaching a subset of therapy? Great question. I appreciate it. So I believe that it's a separate training. Um, to me, in my experience, when I went for coach training, I, I trained with a, an organization based here in Southern California called the College of Executive Coaching. And the College of Executive Coaching is unique in that they only have students who have graduate degrees. And so it was local. I, I went to a one-day seminar, and, and a one-day seminar for me turned into a 128-hour training over a year and a half. And for me, it was really important to work in the coach framework in order to understand the differences between coaching and training, and coaching and therapy, excuse me, and also to understand how the coach world. Uh, the coach client relationship works because I was so used to wearing my therapy hat that it had a, a certain feel to it. But when I started wearing a coaching hat, it had a different feel and a different energy to it. It's hard to describe, but as a coach, I feel like I'm really moving forward with a client much more than a therapist. As a, ther as a therapist, I tend to uh, sit back energetically a little bit more. But as a coach, I'm really partnering much more and, and much more collaborative. Although I do some of that as a therapist, I would say as a coach, I had to learn what it was like that, that felt like coaching versus felt like therapy. And because at, at my training program, it was a lot of the, the trainers, a lot of the faculty had been therapists in the past, one of the things they emphasized were the distinctions. And it took me a while. It took some trial and error to really to tease out the differences. But um, I believe that specialized coach training is, is necessary. Uh, so thank you for that question, Marty. I appreciate it. So, to me, we're moving right on to the foundation of purposeful recovery and what I call the seven keys. So the foundation of purposeful recovery to me is about the three S's, and this is how I think about it. Service, number one, is being there for others. Self-care, number two, is being there for self. And spirituality, number three, is being there for a greater purpose. In other words, what gives your life meaning? And a colleague of mine shared the three S's with me many years ago. And I, I like the simplicity of it because it's all about being there. It's about being, right? It's not about doing, okay? So it's about being there with others. It's about being there with ourselves. <coughs> Excuse me. And it's about being there for something greater than ourselves. Uh, what gives your life meaning, and and we'll talk more about that in a moment. So in my workbook, uh, I came up with the seven keys to purposeful recovery. And the seven keys are, are very straightforward. It's about what I call purposeful recovery, purposeful goal, purposeful action, purposeful connection, purposeful self-care, purposeful forgiveness, and purposeful gratitude. Okay, so these are just ideas that I came up with, but in the workbook, it, it really is meant to be an exploration and an unfolding of what it means to move forward and to not feel so stuck. Because ultimately, I put this workbook together because I saw so many people, including myself at one time, feeling you know, like, like they had uh, moved forward from their addiction, but they haven't 
had it move forward in their life. They felt stuck in different ways. So with that said, we're going to move right on to the seven, the seven keys. Number one being a purposeful recovery. So the idea of purposeful recovery to me is really about being conscious. It's about being awake. And, and it, it's an exploratory process, right? It's really about excavating deep down inside of us and wondering what is it that is about purpose? What is it, what is it that helps us live life with purpose? No. These are big questions, and these are things that in coaching get looked at over weeks and months of time. But I'm just running through these to give you a sense of how I look at the overview. So living life with purpose. What makes life worth living? Spirituality. And this came from a talk that a... a Kaplan over at UCLA gave, he was talking about spirituality and addiction, and his definition of spirituality is whatever gives your life meaning. And so I thought that was fantastic, that whatever gives your life meaning is spirituality. So it doesn't have to be about anything more than that, but it is an exploration, of course. And of course, what, what is the reason to wake up in the morning? So one of the exercises that I do with my coaching clients is a values clarification. And I'm going to give you a very short example of it so that you can maybe use it with yourself or with uh, clients or with family members or whoever you might want to use this with. So if you take a piece of paper, and I don't know if you have a piece of paper or not in front of you, but if you take a piece of paper and ask the question, what matters most to you? What matters most to you? And then once you write something down without overthinking it, ask the same question. And what else matters most to you? And what else matters most? And I think you get the idea. It's almost like wringing a towel. You're trying to put as many things down. It could be half a dozen things, or it could be up to 15 or 20 things. But you're trying to look at what, what really matters most to you. Most people will say things like, um, like my dog matters most to me, or um, my career matters most to me, or laughter matters most to me. So hopefully what they're doing with this quick and easy values clarification is just coming up with what matters most to them. And, and that's really their core values right there. Okay, so if it's laughter, if it's pet, if it's career, if it's love, if it's nature, whatever, whatever that looks like. And that's really a beginning of values clarification. And the reason we do values clarification is because that's a compass to take a look at what is uh, going on in the, in the coach uh, experience. So with goals, with, uh, with doing things, the, uh, with, with coming up with goals and action steps, if they're in alignment with your values, you're going to find more movement. If not, you're going to feel stuck. So values are a foundational part of, of the coach process. Okay, so key number two, purposeful goals. So designing what I call a recovery roadmap is part of what I do. And clarifying goals with my clients, smart goals. Some of you may have heard of them before, specific, measurable, action-oriented results, target date. Smart goals are really getting as clear and concrete with what a person wants to achieve. But what's so important here, and this is called the life satisfaction scale. In my training, we called it the life focus satisfaction. In some other coaches, they call it the wheel of life. But what we're doing 
here with purposeful goals is we're helping uh, ourselves or our clients get really specific about what it is that is uh, the priorities in, in our life so that we don't take everything on at once. So if we can take things on in bite-sized chunks so that we can um, determine how we want to use the, the coaching time. And we're really looking for what is going to help life be most satisfying. So most people will say something like, oh, I, I want my family relationships to be better. So that might be one priority. Um, another person might say, I want my relationship to money to, to be easier. So that might be another one. Another person might say, I, I really want um, to feel more satisfied with my current job. That might be another. So we're looking for two or three priorities, highest priority, that we can focus on so that somebody can feel a sense of competency and a feeling like they can really take on one bite-sized chunk at a time. Okay, so moving right along, P3 is purposeful action. And taking action is something that 12-step talks about, but coaching also talks about it in, a, in another way. And what I say is that it's really about helping somebody stay accountable. I think accountability is huge. And because I tend to be a structured person by nature, I really help clients figure out how to get structured and how to be accountable to what their values, what their purpose, what their uh, action steps are, are really taking shape to look like. So if they're looking at things like money and family relationships and career, how do we structure that and get really, really specific and concrete? And how do we help you put one foot in front of the other um, each day and each week? And some of that to me is about practicing mindfulness and, and getting into a daily routine around self-care and around uh, keeping track and um, having some kind of way to monitor oneself. But it's also about turning goals into realistic, uh, realistic and feasible action steps. Okay, so the accountability comes from the relationship in, with the coach, which is week in and week out, meeting and talking and staying on track. Okay, key four, we are on to purposeful connection. Now, purposeful connection is, is a wonderful one because without feeling connected in the world and to our people, whoever that they might be, chances are we're going to feel like lone rangers and we're going to have difficulty staying on track. So what, what my, I have a colleague named Shelley Campbell who wrote a book called The Wealthy Spirit, and I, I really like The Wealthy Spirit. It's a page a day book that uh, is focused on one's relationship with money, but it's really about our relationship to ourselves and how money manifests as a result of that. And she is very funny, and she talks about dolphins, tuna, and sharks. And I'm going to focus on dolphins today, um, but I'll mention tuna and shark. She, she says that it's important, it's vital that we surround ourselves with dolphins. And the reason why we want to surround ourselves with dolphins is because they're the ones who are playful and communicative, and they like to have fun, and they're loyal, and they're friendly, and they're protective of one another. And uh, what Shelley says is, is that there's your people in the world and there's everybody else. And it's really your job in life to find your people. And in this case, to find your dolphins. And this is really a purposeful connection is about distinguishing the people in your life as folks who can be more shark-like and maybe you know, bite your head off at the last, when you least expect it, or maybe tuna-like, which are more the codependent uh, folks who, who drain all your energy. And um, we all can be dolphin sharks and tuna, by the way, but what we want to do, hopefully, is cultivate the dolphin within us and cultivate uh, dolphins around us, okay, which is what I call your recovery team um, and breaking out of uh, isolation. 
So that's a little bit about that. I also want to say that on your recovery team, your dolphins don't have to be actually living. For instance, my grandmother, who I write about in the workbook, uh, has died many years ago, but she was such a, an important figure in my life. She touched my heart so deeply that she'll always be a major dolphin in my life and inside of me. And so because I internalized her and because she's such a, a unconditional and loving presence for me, a dolphin doesn't have to be actually somebody living. It can be anybody who touched you deeply. All right, so moving right along, key five is purposeful self-care. And purposeful self-care is, is really about being so conscientious and so impeccable with what you do to take care of yourself. And I'm really talking about everything, you know, from food to sex to money to people you surround yourself with to anything that either nourishes you and your life or depletes you in your life, okay? So there's an exercise called more or less, and it's very simple, kind of like what it sounds like. Um, and it goes like this, what do you want more of in your life? Or what do you want to bring into your life more and more? And what do you want less of in your life? What are you putting up with? What are you tolerating? And so the more or less exercise teases out, okay, where do I want to put my energy? And what kind of activities and people and experiences do I want to invite in? And what kind of people and activities and experiences do I want to do less of? And I'm happy to say that after many years, I, I do more of what I want to do more of than I do less of what I want to do less of. Um, it's not a perfect science, of course, but it's being conscientious about what we want to expose ourselves to. And we don't have time to go into this next topic, <coughs> what I call taming codependency. But codependency, in my opinion, is a tremendous slippery slope uh, for those who are heavily practicing codependency. It really is a huge vulnerability to relapse, and it's a self-care issue. And so for those of you who suffer with codependency or know others who suffer with codependency, I really include this idea with purposeful self-care because it's such uh, an under... Um, what's the word, not underreported, but it's, it's just not, it's sort of a secret suffering out there. And so I want to remind people that codependency is a very serious problem and is something that we can take a look at as part of what we're doing and boundaries and, and who we're surrounding ourselves by, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, key six is forgiveness. Now, forgiveness, as most of you know, is part of the 12 steps. <coughs> I'm so sorry, excuse me, just getting over a cold here. Um, so forgiveness is, is about the amend steps, uh, step eight and nine. But forgiveness has more to, to look at, in my opinion, than step eight and nine offer. And what I mean by that is forgiveness is being studied by lots and lots of folks out there. It's being explored by various spiritual backgrounds and um, various people who are helping us look at forgiveness in a new light. And one of the people that I was very struck by is a Dr. Luskin, who's a psychologist at Stanford. And he wrote a book in the 90s called Forgive for Good. And he actually has a few follow-ups uh, as well, but that book was the fundamental book that he put together after the Forgiveness Project was launched at Stanford. And what was so exciting is that the Forgiveness Project was very well-funded. And the fact that a huge institution like Stanford and many other institutions who are looking at positive psychology as a, a very fundamental part of their research and, and psychology programs um, are putting money into understanding how 
well-being can be improved through forgiveness and how we can live more comfortable lives in our own skin and how we can have more effective relationships and relationships that are, are more loving ultimately. So in a nutshell, I, I look in my workbook at three things, forgiving yourself, forgiving others, and allowing others to forgive you. So the reason I broke it down like this is that forgiving yourself is, is tough. That's really shame resiliency work for the most part. But it's also about self-compassion, self-acceptance, self-understanding, and ultimately self-love. Forgiving others is the same thing, really. It's, it's not about forgetting, by the way. He, he makes a point, Dr. Luskin, that forgiving is not about forgetting. As a matter of fact, he worked with some survivors from Ireland who had, whose uh, children had been killed in, in conflicts in Ireland. And, and one of the things that he found is that it's not really about forgetting. It's not, we're not Pollyanna about this, but it is about Hi, everyone. Um, Andrew, it seems we lost sound at around Pollyanna. Is your is everything plugged in? Okay, sorry, everyone. This will just take about a minute. This has happened before on our webinars. Sometimes um, the, the webinar sometimes just has audio issues or video issues. Some of you might have heard a little bit of um, what's it called? Uh, interference at times throughout the webinar, and that just happens sometimes. It's like a typical teleconference when you call in, and there's, you know, it's a, not the best phone line. Um, Andrew, can you shake your head? Yes, if you have got the information on your screen to call, and okay, great. And everyone, go ahead if you want to. Uh, you could still now, you could ask questions in the chat window. Um, We've got about 10 minutes left for the webinar, but we could sometimes we do go a little late, so that's fine. Okay, I'm here, Tom. Great. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Thanks, Andrew. Excellent. Sure, thank you. Okay, so I was saying that we don't want to be Pollyanna about forgiveness. This is really heavy work, uh, heavy lifting emotionally for a lot of folks to go through, but it's really a process. And so forgiving is not about forgetting. Dr. Luskin makes that really clear. Um, but forgiving is ultimately about how do we move through a process so that we don't have to carry around the heaviness of the past. So forgiving yourself, forgiving others, allowing others to forgive you. And this is probably my favorite. I, I always feel like I take an exhale when I look at the gratitude slide because Gratitude, although it can sound really light and airy, it's, it really carries a lot of weight in terms of helping, helping ourselves take stock of what's going right. And so even at the darkest of times, there's always something, a resource inside of us that is, is we can draw upon. I mentioned my grandmother as a resource. I have my dog sitting next to me right now as we talk, and, and so he's a resource. And so gratitude, the attitude of gratitude, as some in 12-step in call it, is really a wonderful launching pad for what it means to give stock of, of areas of our life that really are buoyant and, and resilient. So I talk about letters of this particular slide. Uh, this is one exercise that I suggest, which is a letter of gratitude to a confidant that you feel has been important in your life and has been valuable to you. A letter to yourself, one of gratitude for all the hard work you're putting in and, and for what, what it is that you're striving to do in your life. And then the last one is a letter to your addiction. And the idea of the letter to your addiction is actually twofold. The first part of the letter is a goodbye letter. I'm sorry, I got it backwards. The first part of the letter is a gratitude. 
piece, which is to write about why you're grateful for the addiction. Many times it was self-protective. It was a way of feeling better. It was immediate gratification. It was a way of coping. So the first part is to write gratitude to your addiction. Once you finish with the gratitude piece, then a goodbye letter to to the addiction, and in some ways to um, to thank it, to appreciate it, but then say you uh, you finished your time now. Thank you for being here, but it's time to go. Something along those lines. So our last primary slide I call Imagine the Possibilities, and many of you are familiar with Disney, and Disney was one of the greatest visionaries of our time. However you see him, he was a visionary for sure. He had this vision, and he created it, and he created a community of Imagineers, and um, the Imagineering was really about what is it that we could create that would really make a stamp on the world? And what my co-choice used to say to me is, it, it's not that anything has to happen, but simply what could happen. And I love that because I, it takes the pressure off. Not that anything has to happen, but simply what could happen. So imagining the possibilities is letting yourself breathe. It's giving oxygen to all the different possibilities out there. And then, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Casey Kasem from the uh, the countdown. The, the, I, for me, it was a Saturday morning uh, countdown of hits. But he used to end his show with, reach for the star and keep your feet on the ground. And for some reason, that always stayed with me. Because I, I like that image, to reach for the stars but keep your feet on the ground. And the last thing I want to share is a, a reading that I enjoy called The Path. And I share this with all, my, with all my coaching clients, some of my therapy clients. Apparently, most of the fuel that is used by spaceships traveling to the moon is consumed in just getting them beyond Earth's gravity. After they have done so, NASA scientists count on lunar gravity to pull the spaceship toward the moon. Similarly, it is escape velocity that requires most of the energy moving us away from our former way of life. A compelling vision must be so clear and so powerful that its very magnetism and gravitational forces will literally pull you toward it. So I love that idea that it's the escape velocity that's the, the toughest, it's the hardest work, but that's what helps us move us beyond uh, our, our current way of life. Uh, these are some of the resources that I talked with you about. The coachfederation.org is the International Coach Federation. Authentic Happiness is at the University of Pennsylvania. Recoverycoaching.org. And then my, my website, uh, andrewsuskind.com and westsidetherapist.com. And lastly, since he's sitting right here, this is my my guy. He's a he. This is an old picture, but this is Cooper. And the reason I bring Cooper to our screen is because he is not only a huge resource in my life and a huge source of entertainment and fun and loyalty and love, but he's probably one of my greatest teachers and one of the reasons that my recovery and my life took a turn. Um, about nine years ago in a way that took it to the next level. So <laughs> thank you, Natalie, for uh, sharing. Uh, Natalie wrote, awesome pup. Thank you. Yeah, he is truly an awesome pup. Um, I know it's 1 o'clock. Are there any other questions that anybody would like to ask before we wrap up for today? Okay, from the Center for Healthy Sex, do recovery clients need a certain amount of recovery? Great question. So for coaching, it is a matter of timing for when people will benefit the most from the kind of coaching that I do. So I, the caveat is I tend to work with clients who have at least three to six months of sobriety under their belt because I feel like they're more able to focus and more able to uh, 
uh, collaborate in such a way that they can pay attention to parts of themselves that they weren't able to uh, initially when they get clean and sober. At the same time, there are coaches who do more life skills coaching, and the life skills coaching um, the life skills coaching is more nuts and bolts around everyday activities and self-care and some of the um, just getting on track. So I do have coach uh, colleagues who do that type of recovery coaching. Um, it's not something that I, I would do. Um, all right. I have a couple questions. Please review the coaching slides again quickly. There were three. Okay. I will do my best to find them. Um, okay. So is I think this is what you were talking about. This is the definition of coaching that you could actually go to the coachfederation.org website and they have a similar definition. Um, that would be a great resource in, in general. So coachfederation.org. Um, and I have another question here from Rick Hupp in West Hills. Hi, Rick. And, aw, oh, cute dog is the first comment. And then he says, maybe I missed this, but do you train therapists in recovery coaching skills? Thank you for an inspiring presentation from Marty. Uh, thank you, guys. I appreciate your thoughts about today. Um, you know, I don't train therapists in recovery coaching skills. I do some consulting when it comes to coaches who are building a coaching business. Um, I, I, I do coach coaches who are wanting to build their business, but in terms of actual training, I really defer to some of the coach training programs, such as Crossroads that I mentioned, and some of the other certified coach training programs out there. And um, Renee Fiddler from Calgary, thank you, Andrew, really great presentation. You're very welcome, Renee all the way from Calgary. I really appreciate it. And um, I hope that helps. Um, I hope that helps clarify the coaching piece. And I, I think, um, oh, okay, Michael is ditto, says so ditto, excellent option for those in phase two recovery, especially, I'd say. That's right on, Michael. I couldn't agree more. Phase two recovery is the most optimal time for coaching, phase two and beyond, of course. Great. Thank you so much, Andrew. You're welcome. Thank you, Tom. And everyone, you can find the recording of this lecture on our YouTube channel, www.youtube.com backslash Center for Healthy Sex. And please join us next month, March 11th. We'll be having a webinar on relational trauma with Marnie Breaker. All right, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.